the concept of the democratic republic, the concept of republicanism as a key aspect of, of Marxist thought, Marxist thought and Marx and Engels' thought, right, uh, has been lost somewhere within the 20th century. I Het is zondag 10 mei en dit is Linkse Hobby's podcast van Authentiek Links. Vandaag hebben we een uitgebreid interview met Ben Lewis over zijn recente werk Karl Kautsky on Democracy and Republicanism. Hierin zijn een aantal centrale teksten van de zogenaamde paus van het Marxisme voor het eerst vertaald uit het Duits in het Engels. Die ingaan over een Marxistische houding ten opzichte van het parlement en wat de Democratische Republiek eigenlijk betekent. Beide onderwerpen worden vaak verkeerd begrepen op Marxistisch links, dus staan we er eens uitgebreid bij stil. We hebben er weer een nieuwe maandelijkse donatie bij. Bedankt, kameraad Jeroen, voor je 10 euro. Die gaan we zeker weer inzetten voor verdere interviews als deze en scholingstreams, waarvan we er weer volgende week in hebben. Gus zal deze keer de scholing doen over klassenstrijd anno 2020. Wil je die niet missen? Kijk dan zeker op onze Facebookpagina en zet jezelf op Gaan in het evenement. And then, now Ben. Let's uh, start with the uh, with the beginning. Uh, so, could you pre- please uh, introduce yourself uh, for the people that are many that don't uh, know you? <laughs> okay. Well, my name is Ben Lewis. I'm uh, what am I? I'm a translator, historian, uh, with a particular focus on the history of the labor movement, uh, with a even more particular focus on the history of the uh, Second International, and even more of a focus, if you like, with the <laughs> Uh, life and work of uh, Karl Kautsky and its disputed legacy. Um, and so I've been working on these areas of thought now for about uh, 10 years or so, maybe a bit, little bit longer than that. Um, and yeah, I've done a number of books and articles and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I'm still making plans, so still going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've uh, published, I believe, two books on an earlier date. Um... To, uh... Yeah, two or three. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. So there was the the book on the Halle Congress of mm. Independent Social Democracy in 1920, uh, the small little booklet with uh, that I did with Mike McNair and uh, uh, Maciek Sarovsky on uh, colonialism and Karl Kautsky in the late 1890s, mm-hmm. uh, the book on Clara Zetkin, Zetkin's letters and writings, okay. and most recently, yes, the uh, the, the the book with be discussing later on the yes. Kautsky on democracy and republicanism. Exactly, Karl Kautsky on democracy and republicanism, mm-hmm. edited and translated by you. So, um, what uh, brought you to uh, write this book, uh, or rather translate it? Because you, in, in the introduction, uh, you yourself identify not one, two, but three schools of thought that actually damn uh, the renegade Kautsky. Uh, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> why do this now? Uh, like, yeah. uh, I believe, what is it now, 80 years after his death? Sure. No, I think um, so. Uh, th- there's two things. I've had a more general interest in Karl Kautsky for a long time, partly because I think he's so uh, misunderstood and misappropriated, as I as I outlined in the in the introduction. Um, more concretely, in terms of the text that I've done, so the uh, uh, the the series on uh, republicanism in France and parliamentarism. Um, I always remember just looking around. It was I think it, there was some kind of royal wedding here in Britain. And I, I was kind of looking around for um, Marxist discussions of republicanism. And that's how I came across the um, the, the series on, on French republicanism by Kautsky. Uh, it was initially discussed briefly by Lars Lee at a historical materialism conference. And that's how, kind of, how I became kind of familiar with it. And it looked interesting. And it was one of the rare or the, the few rare uh, extended discussions of republicanism I could find. So I thought it'd be quite a good idea to get that into into English uh, so that its arguments find a hopefully a wider audience. Um, the, the parliamentarism text, I s- first became aware of that again when reading uh, Lars Lee's uh, um, What is to be done in context, Lenin rediscovered, um, where he outlines, outlines in some detail the, the importance of that text uh, for Lenin in particular. And I mm-hmm. thought, well, again, this is it's quite strange. I think there is a Dutch translation, isn't there, of parliamentarism? Uh, but there's there's no English mm. translation, mm. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a bit weird given the uh, the importance of this text uh, in in the history of uh, of the Marxist 
uh, movement and Marxist thought. So I thought that would be a, a good reason to get the, that uh, text into uh, into English as well. So I set about on both of them uh, over the course of several years. And the uh, I also then kind of combined that with my own academic uh, career or background, if you like, uh, by writing then a, a, an essay extent. Well, my, my MA dissertation was on uh, Kautsky, Kautsky's legacy and Kautsky on democracy, which kind of forms the uh, the introduction, the extended introduction to all the material. So it all came together really over the course of about eight or nine years. And then obviously you put it into uh, be published. That takes another two or three years. And then it came out <laughs> <laughs> finally last October. So it's a, it's a, it's a big chunk of my uh, a life, as you say, it's quite a large volume, and it's, it's you know, yes. it is. It's a, there's a lot of sweat <laughs> uh, that's been that's gone into it, basically. Yeah, and it is uh, really well done, I have to say. Uh, Thank you very much. So it's um, uh, so Karl Kautsky on democracy and republicanism, as the yeah. full title is, is really an expose of Kautsky's political outlook, consisting mm -hmm. uh, out of three main parts, besides your introduction. Um, so all of which are translated into English for the first time, I believe. Um, that, so that's right. Could could you take us on a journey what these parts cover? Sure. So the uh, I briefly mentioned the, um, the 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 introduction, which is is a, is a long essay that I wrote uh, mainly for my for my MA. It's slightly updated for the book, um, and that essentially looks at why is it that. Um, Karl Kautsky as a political thinker uh, uh, and, uh, and activist, if you like, has been so marginalized. Now, obviously, the, the response to that in, in kind of acad in the world of academia or in bourgeois, bourgeois thought more generally, Marxism isn't exactly the order of the day. And so that's kind of understandable that he would be marginalized as a kind of another dogmatic, uh, fatalist, determinist Marxist. That's that you can kind of understand that, right? Mm -hmm. But this, but the strange thing is, for, for me, is that the even when it comes to the, uh, the you know Marxist thinkers, far left thinkers, people you would think would be a lot more sympathetic towards his ideas and his contribution, um, they basically say the same thing as the as the academics and the the Western historians. So that was the um, that's that's the kind of paradox I explore in uh, Kautsky's reception in the in the twentieth century. And then I go to uh, parliamentarism, which is basically a, a, his history. Kautsky was very much one of these uh, people, um, the, several of them in, in the past, but he was kind of the leading guy in the Second International that would look at a, a particular dispute or controversial issue within the, the workers' movement and then take a big step back from that and try and uh, establish a historical overview uh, of it, uh, a historical uh, basis for this particular point, and go into uh, into much detail from the standpoint of what he understood as Marxist theory of history. So, uh, parliamentarism uh, is basically a response to uh, debates within the German social democratic movement around the nature of democracy in the modern state. Uh, what the roles of parliament, uh, role of uh, parliamentarians should be, parliamentarians of social democratic persuasion, mm -hmm. uh, and he kind of then just goes, as I say, st take, takes that outlines those discussions. What is the nature of democracy, uh, and and kind of traces it back through through history, uh, and it's a long extended and you know not uh, interesting text on on the, on all of that. Uh, so that's that's the 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 the, the, the parliamentarism text. The republicanism uh, uh, series is, is slightly is slightly different in that it was never a published book. It was actually a series of I think about seven or eight articles in Die Neue Zeit, which was the weekly theoretical that he edited, uh, and that's it. Basically, a response to uh, what we could call in 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 a in a loose sense the the forces of, of Millerandism and the, the the debates that that ushered in around what is the nature of um, the socialist project for government uh, is it permissible to join a uh, a bourgeois government to um, be part of a coalition within the realms of the capitalist state in order to defend the French Republic, etc. And then he again he takes a step back from these direct issues, goes back to Marx, goes back to the history of France in all the various revolutions uh, from 1789 through the uh, the 19th century up until the pre his his present day. Uh, and American republicanism, etc., and then draws his own conclusions uh, about that. Um, so that's that's part two, as it were. Um, and then we've got the uh, 
some uh, this is actually published elsewhere this was published in the historical materialism journal as well uh, this is a, a life sketch that he wrote in 1924 I think probably because he thought he was going to die in the end he, he lived for about 14 15 more years um, but he was asked to you know, provide an overview of his thought and uh, how it came about and how he became a Marxist. It's called uh, Das Werden eines Marxist and you know, the development or the becoming of a Marxist. Um, and yeah, that shed some some interesting light on his development as a thinker. There are some quite significant omissions, <laughs> I would argue, in, in, in his overview of his own life that, that are revealing, which maybe we can discuss later on. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that, that's there as well, just to, just to provide a little bit more background to him and how he understood him, himself as a thinker mm -hmm. and his role, uh, his place in that sense in, in, in working class history. And finally, um, something maybe slightly more esoteric or academic, perhaps, but um, while researching the, um, the book, I came across this study by um, Gilsha Holti, um, Ingrid Grisha Holti, who um, I can't remember, the, the, it's called The Mandate of the Intellectual in German. And uh, she appended to that book uh, all the different drafts of the Erfurt program, which is the, the you know, the, the kind of uh, the flag of, of German social democracy that was uh, that, uh, people in various countries at the time tried to plant in their own on their own soil as well, as it were. Um, and I've kind of traced through through a translation of these drafts, all the different basically the genesis of this program, how it came about, what Engels had to say, what Babel had to say, what Kautsky did, what was removed, what was kept in, et cetera, et cetera. So slightly more specialist, uh, but nonetheless, uh, hopefully uh, of interest to, to a broader audience, given the significance of the effort program uh, for you know, the history of our movement. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty yeah, that, that is quite a, a nice uh, overview. Thank you for that. As uh, uh, just to, um, to to position Kautsky and and the SPD uh, of the era uh, for today's uh, left, because mm. much of today's left has inherited much of this early movement, often without, without even knowing the first thing about it. Sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> when, when, when I look at the left today, I mainly see organizations in, for example, the, the Dutch Socialist Party, uh, which active, uh, in which activism is an integral part of its being. Mm -hmm. um, now, this has its origins in the period of when the SPD was still a Marxist party, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's, as, as far as I'm aware, that's you know that, that was you know the, the Labour Party here in this country is slightly is slightly different. It's got its own particular history. It was part of uh, the Second International, um, but really the core of the uh, the so-called Second International, the Socialist International, um, were built on explicitly Marxist parties, kind of around the core of. Uh, the um, the German SPD. When it came to the founding conference of the Second International, for instance, there were <laughs> there were in effect two different conferences that competed for the for the name. Uh, but it was always the the, the Marxist wing uh, that the, that was the kind of the leading uh, Second International force. Because other there was the other one that was uh, trying to unite forces that be beyond Marxism, and that that was that pitted out and didn't become anything. So that was the uh, that's as you're right. That's the history and the origins of these mm -hmm. of, of these things um but the party was also in uh, in the in its the parliament of its day the reichstag yeah uh, for which uh, it is nowadays well if people know about it they they are remembering this period of course eh, for voting for the war credits and betraying sure. uh, the cause of socialism sure. um so <laughs> i wanted to chime in a bit on where you quote quoted uh, kautsky um I'll, I'll just read it out sure what what holds uh, political parties together particularly uh, when they have a great historical role to fulfill, such as the Social Democratic Party, are its final goals, not its immediate goals. Mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, not ideas about how the party should behave regarding all the individual's issues uh, that confront it. Now, this particularly rings true to, uh, well, my party today, the Socialist Party, mm -hmm. that has also this big focus on the struggles of today. Um, and, and well, much of the left has this basic, uh, basically the same outlook of uh, 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 connecting to the existing movement. Um, but Kautsky is a very explicit against this kind of uh, party, isn't it? Isn't he? Yeah, I think I think the point he's making there is that the the, the unity of uh, a working class organisation 
flows from its program fundamentally. Mm-hmm. It fr- it flows from its. So the fi- you know the final goal is sometimes uh, das Endziel. I don't know what the, the the Dutch equivalent is, but it's 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 sometimes a a kind of strange thing to get across because it's not just about the the ultimate telos, the you know the final aim, as it were. Mm-hmm. It's it's about how the whole uh, how the whole strategic overlook coheres, re- flowing from that uh, that the outlook that we want to establish socialism, and from that we work backwards from that with our principles, and we establish kind of the base on which the party is built, if that makes sense, right? So it's not just about the goal in that sense; it's about the the whole strategic outlook built around the program, and then yes, what happens from there. Is that you know these are obviously artistic questions as well. You can't you know they need to be decided be decided as they as they unfold. But the from from it, it's that basic structure, the programmatic uh, strategic structure, which which informs the party, which which on which it's built. And then yes, questions over tactics about you know whether to stand in this election, whether to vote a certain way on this or that question, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, that's decided. Uh, um, as things go along by the by the organization within the the realm uh within the framework of the of the strategic principles on which it's built if that makes sense so that that's the basic argument he's making so it's not saying uh on the one hand you know uh we all have to agree on um the finest detail of uh, of our overall philosophy mm-hmm. um and it's also not saying that we have to agree on every single tactical matter um that that's what it's saying. It's saying we, we need to be part of this movement, and you know. But you you raise the, the you know the spectre of, of of war credits, and clearly that would be an example for me at least where mm-hmm. the um it 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 it's a choice that's made that's clearly in breach of the party's underlying principles and strategy, right? right? So that that's the that that's the kind of point he's he's making, I think. Mm-hmm. And I th- I think that's an interesting one for um for today because as you say many left organizations will start on you know the basis of you know absolute agreement on this and that and the other uh and that's how they seek to become mass and that hasn't really worked so far <laughs> and now this this party this uh, the SPD of this mm-hmm. period and uh, from the late 1880s when the when these uh, repression laws uh, break down i believe mm-hmm. it was in that period up until yeah. Uh, up until 1914 is characterized by the so-called Erfurt program Mm -hmm. and what particularly struck me about this uh, was its division into a minimum and a maximum part Mm -hmm. Uh, could you perhaps elaborate on the structure and how these parts work in relation to each other Sure. Uh, well, it, it kind of flows from what I've just I've just said. Um, mm-hmm. Is that you know the you 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 cannot have one without the other, as it were. So you need the, you do need the maximal. The, the 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 ultimate aim is you know the, the Commonwealth of Labour. I think is what he describes it in in, in the effort program. You know the the, the socialist society, um, and from so from those perspectives, from those aims, you then. Uh, um, draw and derive your uh, minimum program and in a sense vice versa right because the the, the, the demands that are outlined in the uh, minimum program also pave the way to the realization of those goals now the the way i would describe this structure and the framework is to is to address a common uh, misconception misunderstanding of the minimum program which is to see it as a kind of minimal program mm. right um and the misunderstanding again is one that's on the left as well as in uh, kind of bourgeois historical thought. So often you'll hear that the, the effort program described as a formally Marxist program, or in, in slightly more charged uh, polemical language, a kind of pseudo or fake uh, um, Marxist program. Right. The reason that these people offer is that yes, okay, they talk about you know the grand aims of a free society, overcoming capitalism. Uh, but ultimately, the, the the reforms they put forward in the minimum section of the program are completely divorced from that. And this is this is worth elaborating slightly in, in slightly more detail because, in a sense, that is what happens to that that is what becomes of the SPD later on with the rise of opportunism, right? But if we take if we leave that to one side for now, the 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 structure in which and this follows from. Uh, Marx and Engels, in particular, their political writings, their understanding of of uh, the, the revolutions of the nineteenth century, etc. The minimum program is essentially uh, the best way of understanding it is the minimum that a workers' party and the working class would accept mm-hmm. in terms of uh, conditions in order to take power. Mm-hmm. Right um, now, that 
involves a whole uh, swathe of things. Kautsky does a particularly good job, I think, in the Republic text here and outlining what those preconditions are. Um, you know, so you can you can they, they fall under the rubric of the Democratic Republic um, and involve a whole sort of thing. You know, the armed people. Uh, regular elections, officials on the workers' wage doesn't come uh, in the effort program, but it's it's in that kind of spirit, and it flows from you know Marx and Engels's understanding of the Paris Commune as a, a as a, a workers' government essentially, um, and all the things that that would entail. So it's a range of uh, of of political and economic demands that basically would. Uh, um, put the working class in in power to usher in the stage to 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 open up the uh, development then to the realization of the maximum program which obviously cannot be done within the framework of germany itself mm-hmm. um so but the but the the just to, to to finish the point the the way it's often seen as i say is some kind of minimal uh program that just offers you know things like the eight hour day universal suffrage etc etc uh completely divorced from reality and and that's not the that's not the case and i think i I'm, I, hopefully I show that in the book and also with uh, um, reference to the particular drafts of the Air Foot program, how all of these things uh, fit together. And you have to realize that, you know, something like the eight hour day or universal suffrage might not seem that radical from today's perspective, perhaps. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, we're, we're talking in the, the, the framework of, uh, you know, Kaiser Germany as well, where, as you say, the, the, the organization or the precursor to the organization was illegal for 12 years as well. So mm-hmm. it, it is, it's, it's, it's not a minimal program. It's the minimum uh, a set of uh, demands and conditions uh, on which or, th- or through which the working class would assume uh, political power. Right. So another way to think about the minimum program is to basically see it as a form of self-exclusion from government participation, a program of principled opposition. That's right. Um, and I think it is worthwhile to dive into this a bit more because mm-hmm. in the socialist party there at least there's this widespread idea that if you don't seem reasonable if you don't aim for the next for participation in the next coalition just to be uh, quite clear the the socialist party hasn't participated in a coalition government just yet <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, but the yeah. aim is there sure um, so basically because of this idea you uh, uh, that that if you don't aim for it, you won't achieve anything, and as a result, people will stop voting for you, and you mm-hmm. become irrelevant. So mm-hmm. why did it, that happen to the SPD then? Why why didn't it happen? Did, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I th- I think the um, they were in a, in a very good position to put across their their ideas once they came out of illegality, um, and I, it basically pays. Uh, a testament to their approach it testifies to this, the, the correctness of the approach that you know the, the, the fundamental idea is unless you start from your principles and then seek broad broad support for them patiently you know going out not just uh, to to strikes and demonstrations but really building an alternative in within society itself a state within a state as Clara Zetkin uh, called it um, you're not really going to break the electoral cycle, which f- fundamentally, if if you're, you know, the bourgeois electoral cycle is, if it, if it's about winning votes, then ultimately it's it's doing little more than holding up a mirror to the existing prejudices uh, uh, and, and kind of craziness of uh, of modern society, right? That's why you get these all these wonderful maneuvers within within the elect uh, the electoral process. The SPD had a different approach, was to say, look, here are our principles. Um, we know we're not going to be able to enact them tomorrow. Uh, we know that it's we can't just simply join uh, a, you know a government. I mean, some people did think that the, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. on the right wing of the SPD, they thought you know the Staatssozialist and and you know people who wanted an alliance with Bismarck originally, etc. You know, we could have some sort of socialism within the Kaiser state. But the Marxist approach was to say no, that's not going to happen. And in order for it to happen, we need to exploit every avenue for our ideas that we can. Uh, and 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 build a, a, an alternative society within the, the the society we're seeking to overthrow, as it were. And that that's that's a marked contrast to. I mean, if you look, I I know uh, far less about the Dutch Socialist Party, but if you contrast that to today's SPD, which mm. you know, form, formally renounced Marxism, I mean, it, it done it a long time before anyway. But the, the day in the, the year in which it formally abolished any commitment to Marxism was 1959 mm. in a in a place just outside Bonn. Uh, and what's become of that organization since is that, yes, it, it, it's premised on the idea that 
the whole thing about socialism, so-called, or you know, uh, progressive politics, is to win elections. Um, and you know that's led it to all sorts of uh, strange places politically, and now it's just a kind of uh, embourgeoisified shell of its former self. Really, it's just a you know a kind of hang- clinging on to the uh, the coalition with the CDU and CSU. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's that you know, to, to see the two different uh, uh, approaches to electoralism. Uh, that's quite a nice way to look at it from the, the history of the SPD itself, right? Right, a uh, sad state of affairs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you already alluded to it. The this this mass strategy, this this mass organization, um, a strategy of patience, I believe it was called. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we had a, the the SPD was much more than merely a, a parliamentary faction. Faction. Now in. Uh, to make another link towards the Socialist Party uh, nowadays, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, in the Socialist Party, we have this broad network of local branches that go on knocking on people's doors and neighborhoods as a way of organizing them into tenants campaigns and the like. Mm-hmm. But the SPD did a whole lot more, did, did it not? That's that's right. So it's uh, the, the, the whole vision essentially was to... Uh, not just have, as you say, the electoral face, the parliament, the parliamentary stuff, which is all very important because, you know, one of the, you know, you look at someone like August Babel, he was very effective at exposing, uh, you know, the, the dodgy machinations of the Kaiser state and he would be pr- printed in the newspapers, etc., etc. And, you know, the, the SPD would have its own huge uh, uh, um, newspaper infrastructure, for example, hundreds of publications of, de- of varying uh, uh, um, natures and, and interests and specialties etc so you know you've got things like the socialist academic uh the the, the free female gymnast i think is one of my favorite ones uh <laughs> right um you know so, so it, it, it would it would have its own associations dancing singing community mm-hmm. groups etc etc and also produce uh and uh, uh news uh, um information ideas arguments d- directed to a particular audience you know you, mm-hmm. uh, to take a, a much better example uh die gleich Equality, which was edited by Clara Zetkin until she was thrown out, you know, had a particular focus on on women trying to access the, the minds and ideas of, of, of women uh, uh, workers, etc., uh, which wasn't a straightforward process. But yes, it had this idea that, you know, in order for us to become a force in society, if we really want to be able to ch- make the changes in society that we desire, uh, mm-hmm. we cannot simply just rely on on knocking doors as it were we need our own press we need our own media uh, we need our own message uh, uh, getting out in in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways sporting associations cultural right. associations etc so that's uh, that's something which i think is uh, is is quite inspiring in its own way right um, I quite like the uh, Freie Gastwerk uh, myself. Uh, so. Yeah, that's right. There we go. Yeah, we've all, we've all got our, uh, our particular, <laughs> particular um, favorite ones. But yeah, exactly. But, you know, pubs. It's, uh, there's, a quote, there's a really nice quote from Kautsky somewhere where he says, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure if it applies to COVID-19, but he basically says that, uh, you know, a working class without pubs is nothing. Uh, it's, it's not it's not a political it's not a political class it's just something you know that lives and and, and works and and that's it basically you know uh so the yes the, the whole pub movement and uh, drinking etc was uh, also massive massive part in the dutch uh, workers movement uh, we had much more a strong influence from the teetotalers uh, uh, movement right uh, yeah so, <laughs> so <laughs> it was also that in germany too in the spd oh, really? too yeah yeah so, so you know you had you had all these these different things and i'm, I'm sure at, at various points that you know they, they would have clashed on certain things you know the um i think kautsky himself wrote an article on uh, alcohol uh, and the proletariat and you know looking at both sides of the argument he was against the teetotalers but he kind of <laughs> agreed with some of their arguments etc cetera, etc cetera, on you know uh, drinking too much etc cetera, etc cetera, and health and so you, you know it, it it probably would be worth Werner Liedke's study I can't remember what it's called now um, that's kind of the, the most wide-ranging one of some of these cultural uh, institutions and associations but something you know it certainly would be a good idea to have a closer look at these journals and what they said and all the different groups because there is a lot more than meets the eye and that I would more than I would know certainly and this genuinely was a mass movement. I, I uh, remember reading about a, a workers Olympiad in the 1920s where yeah. hundreds of thousands of people participated actually in, in, the, in the games. That's right. Um, 
So that's just, that's yeah, quite yeah, quite big. <laughs> there, there were several. I think the last one um, was postponed because it was literally the day before. Uh, it was meant to be in Barcelona, and I think it was the day the Spanish uh, civil war broke out, right. basically. Yeah. And that was that was it. So that was you know it's one another aspect of uh, European working class history that was almost literally drowned in blood, essentially, um, because mm. it was you know that was the end of it, and it was a shame. And and again, you read all these wonderful stories like. Uh, the Austrian workers' football team beating the official bourgeois team, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a whole history there, which, you know, social and cultural history, which uh, would certainly be looking at in, in more detail. Right. Um, as one listener asked during our last uh, educational live stream, um, where did it go wrong? Uh, <laughs> sure. So how did how did the uh, how did we go from the SPD uh, then to where we are how to where social democracy is now or sure. to narrow down this question a bit? <laughs> um, why did we go from a position of principled opposition to where we voted for war credits? And that's a, that, that's kind of picks up on the point I was making earlier on about minimal and minimum demands, right? Because the many of the objections that uh, I talked about that you know treating the SPD's program, the effort program, as a as a minimal program, mm -hmm. uh, they they are based that this they are based on something real because you can read. I, I was just been rereading uh, Rosa Luxemburg when she introduces the uh, the program of the Communist Party in early 1920. And I disagree with some of the conclusions, but some of the points she makes on how they got there are very, uh, very important and, and insightful. And she argues that basically what happened to the party is precisely that instead of the uh, uh, minimum demands being always treated as part of the underlying framework of, of a higher society of working class power, Mm -hmm. uh, they did literally become just the the the, the, the uh, a means to an end in themselves, right? So, the talk of socialism, the maximum program, free humanity, yada yada, that was just kind of reduced to Sunday speeches, right? Uh, as as Luxembourg calls it, a, a distant star. I think she describes it as right. That and they were completely then divorced from. Um, some of the uh, fr from from the the actual uh, uh, struggle of the party and what it was trying to do. Now that's the, that's kind of on the ideological plane. I hope that makes mm -hmm. sense. So in a sense, the minimum program did uh, was kind of reduced to something that it's now being <laughs> become falsely seen as. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, that's kind of on the ideological intellectual plane. But I think you know clearly um, th there are material forces in involved in that. Uh, when you have an organization that that's that, that is so big, uh, so successful, it obviously has a huge army of employees. Um, it, the question of the trade union bureaucracy, the relationships to the trade unions, um, y you know, how a lot of the working class of officials then might become slightly separated or divorced from the reality of the of the membership, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's not as if it's not as if that happens in 1914 and everyone's really surprised. That, that I think that's that's that is uh, obviously everyone's shocked. I mean, Rosa Luxemburg talks about committing suicide, etc. It's it's a big hit for the for the for the movement. This was the the party that was you know leading the way in in looking to oppose the First World War that kind of everybody knew was coming in some form, mm -hmm. right? It's, it, exactly. It's not that it came like a bolt out of the blue in 1914. Right. That these trends had been emerging for some time. That you know, people are putting the the the, the kind of the, the movement, as it were, before the long term aims. Uh, maybe we could go into coalition with this this or that party and get some real success, get some real reforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, there were there were tendencies, and you know, they don't just date back to the revisionist debate in the 1890s. They go right through. I mean, I've been reading a lot about Marx and Engels in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, you know, dealing with all sorts of these the, the reformist tendencies, et cetera, et cetera, and how to best approach them. Um, but they obviously culminate um, and you have the 1914, uh, uh, the war credits vote. Then you have the split in social democracy, which I would argue is essentially the old for approach kind of reasserting itself in 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 some form albeit not necessarily very clearly and uh, and, and sometimes quite a confused fashion mm -hmm. um and and that's where you end up and then as a result of the november revolution you basically have the, the spd 
for the first time in government and uh, in coalition government with uh, the Liberals and the Centre Party, a Catholic Party. And that's kind of, a, that's really where you can start to say, okay, the SPD uh, intellectuals, Kautsky, when he rejoins them, uh, but even when he doesn't rejoin, when he's in the USPD, he's making the point that now we've got the Socialist Republic, now we've got the Democratic Republic. Uh, and I think it all goes a bit wrong from there. Um, <laughs> But uh, but obviously it's a lot more complicated than that because the history of the history of the SPD you know I don't really see the SPD as a workers organisation anymore you, I mean you, you you can make clearly make the argument it's organic relationship to the trade unions etc cetera, etc cetera. there is that mm -hmm. but you know fundamentally it's uh, you know even in the twenties it was uh, uh, you know it was clearly still a, a, a mass working class organisation mm -hmm. uh, but it was starting to move away from from its original ideas in in some strong way and then by fifty nine completely abandons uh, Marxism is then kind of brought into the Cold War consensus in uh, in in post World War Two society in Western Europe and you know it it's, it's goes from there really. Just to pick up on this and give yeah. it a small twist, perhaps. Yeah. Um, in my previous question, I was specifically saying we, because in the far left, there's this tendency uh, that I see coming back and uh, again and again of putting away the traders as them, uh, that they were always opportunists. Um, if we only had pure leaders, we would simply uh, had, uh, and, and simply expel the rest of it. All, uh, everything would be uh, fine. Mm. Um, this is basically the modus operandi of most of the left working in uh, uh, is working in today, and which inevitably leads to small sects that are irrelevant. Um, so this clearly is a counterproductive analysis. Um, yeah. So I, I just, I just, sorry. I, I, mm. If you want, if you want to ask a question, there you can go on. I just wanted to add. I, I would add the caveat there, though, that the problem is these these questions are they, they cannot just simply they cannot be laid down in some kind of uh, algorithm, as it were. Do you know right. what I mean? That, that, like mm. there is clearly the case that you know many of the people uh, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, many of the people that did what they did in the SPD on the right at some point should have been excluded from the party on some level. Now that's easy for us right. to say now. You know that's easy for us to say now in the particular form that it would take etc is is uh, uh, is very difficult i agree with the fundamental point though that you know you just you just keep splitting and splitting because someone doesn't agree with you on x that it doesn't yeah. really lead very far but you know clearly these are these were questions that had to be raised and and the the difference i suppose between uh again there are many differences but one of the differences between mm. the experience of the rsdlp and the spd was the existence of the bolshevik uh, uh faction um which did kind of uphold those principles the, the, the difficult thing with the SPD is that to all intents and purposes, until at least about 1910, maybe slightly after the death of August Babel, the, the, uh, the Marxist faction is, is, is also kind of the leadership. So they, they've always kind of got the, the, the upper hand in terms of the politics, but they never quite deal with the... Uh, uh, the, the opportunists or the revisionists, so-called, right. that, that keep asserting themselves in the party, that do organise as a faction, and then it kind of all comes out in in 1914. It, that's a very simplified way of looking at it because there's right. very complex questions, you know, in terms of German defence, Russia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a it's a big debate in social democracy, but clearly, um, you know, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, something should have been done, and and the way it was resolved in the end was actually negatively, i.e. Uh, people like Kautsky, even or Zetkin, getting kicked out of the party in 1917, uh, and the USPD, uh, etc. Experience. So it probably came a little bit late in hindsight. But. Well, I, I think that the uh, question of of splitting at that point in time was essentially correct that to split, Absolutely. but be it for a different reason. Um, so the reason that is often recited uh, that that you've basically just uh, mentioned here mm. uh, that that's uh, of because of the betrayal because of refounding the party on principled grounds is essentially an incorrect analysis. Uh, splitting over the question because it was a bureaucratic uh, right wing that took power in, in the party. And that was aim, aiming at expelling or silencing mm. all the critical elements. Uh, that that sh should have been the ground of expelling. But I think Mike McNair made the point in his uh, book Revolutionary Strategy quite mm. well, uh, in that this split has been over theorized um, at that point in time, mainly by Lenin, also by others, um, and that we've basically inherited that kind of our over theorization uh, in, in our current uh, movements, which is, has been very uh, unproductive, I believe. 
No, sure. I, I, I think generally speaking, that 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 is that is correct um, because it's kind of seen as the as 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 a model, but it it's just so confused then because of the the lack of the understanding of <laughs> of the, the the true nature of social democracy in the first place, right? So it get, it get it gets very confused. All I'm saying is that with hindsight, mm-hmm. clearly something would have had to, should have right. been done, you know, mm-hmm. and and I think. Um, this is where I criticize people like Kautsky and Babel, for example, as well. I think actually, had they taken a slightly different approach, or even Luxembourg, who always kind of refused, she was very indifferent to the fra- the whole question of a strong faction and dealing with the right wing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because she kind of thought the logic of struggle itself would drive the right wing out, mm-hmm. uh, which is, again, very s- simplified version of what she said, but that, that's the kind of broad take. Um and I think that 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 you know if if look, looking back you could see okay uh, the uh, the left dealt with the SPD right in a way that didn't result in 1914 um, then that would have been much better. But in the end, 1914 means that the the party splits kind of on the rights terms, uh, you know, and it's not a, a victory in that sense. It's a it's a defeat. Even though the USPD was very substantial, eventually ended up basically leading the German Revolution, founded the forces of german communism right um but uh, so i think that that just looking back that's all you could you could say uh, and it's not as i say it's not as if 1914 came out of nowhere people were aware of the the party and some of the worrying tendencies and some of the things it was saying and doing um for some time right now there's this whole new layer in your book that could perhaps be summarized by the, the uh, American sales page. Uh, but wait, there is more. <laughs> but wait, there's um, more. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that would be part two, the Republic and the Social Democracy in France. Mm-hmm. Now, this is quite unique in that no major Marxist theoretician up to this day, I believe, has spent much on this question. Mm. Um, but the left never really took, took a look at it. Um, Hackett is now being translated into English for the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> so why is that? And why do you think that it deserves better? Oh, that's a big question. I think... Um, I, I think all, all I would say is that the, the 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 particular history behind it is quite complicated. But all I would say is that the the concept of the democratic republic, the concept of republicanism as a key aspect of of Marxist thought, Marxist thought and Marx and Engels's thought, right, uh, has been lost somewhere within the 20th century. I think probably it's along the experience of uh, maybe it's a kind of response to the experience of Stalinism. Uh, where democratic republic was kind of hollowed out just to mean kind of popular frontism on some level, right? Um, also, as I alluded to uh, from the other side, the SPD basically um, uh, treating subsequently after, after the revolution, treating the democratic republic as if it was kind of Weimar, mm. right? Or, or maybe even uh, uh, the Bundesrepublik since 1949, you know, that kind of idea. So the softening and toning down of it. And I think for the for that reason, and you see it in Luxembourg as well in, in 1920 on her program, programmatic writings, there's a kind of healthier version then to that term and the minimum program and the democratic mm-hmm. republic is kind of, oh, this is basically soft uh, sellout politics where, you know, we're limiting ourselves to doing a nice deal with the liberals, right? Um, and I think that's that's a shame. I say it's, it's slightly more complicated than that. Um, and there, there have been people that have written on it uh, to some degree, but I, I, I would say generally are more from the Stalinist background. Mm. Again, quite a big claim, but uh, but I think that's probably <laughs> true. Um, and certainly what, what, I've, what I've looked up and, and been reading. Uh, so it was nice for me that that was the that, that was the, the the really nice thing when I, when I came across the the Kautsky text on republicanism in the context of a, a royal wedding here in Britain because I thought yeah this is something I can definitely work with and um, and so yeah I think that's why it's been marginalised what uh, what's particularly good as well for, from my perspective and and I think is useful uh, for readers more generally in understanding someone like Kautsky is that by looking at these writings from 1904, 1905, mm-hmm. we can then compare and contrast them quite directly with the, the stuff that he was writing in 1918, 1919, where he did say that basically what what became Weimar was a socialist republic or a democratic republic. He does use both terms a bit confusingly. Uh, and then you compare that and contrast it, what he says about the Paris Commune or the French Third Republic. And actually, he's kind of he would then be forced to have an argument with himself, as it were, right? 
Um, and there's another level at which is interesting, at least in terms of our, our history, because in state and revolution, um, Lenin, um, not Lenin's best text, uh, the, the, the uh, but, sorry, in, in, in the proletarian revolution of the renegade Kautsky, not Lenin's best, best text, he basically makes a number of claims that uh, Kautsky never theorized the uh, um, uh, the way in which the working class would assume power, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and and that they that aren't really backed up anymore because there, there's evidence that he did do it quite explicitly in yeah. these texts, right? Uh, so there's a number of levels I think that's quite important and interesting. So uh, I, I believe Lenin was quite aware of what Kowski wrote, uh, just yeah. to uh, put it mildly. So yeah. he, didn't he know about his text then, or? Well, you've got to remember this is, so Lenin's writing in 1918, 1919, right? And um, and State and Revolution is 1917, obviously. Um, so I think I think there is a possibility that he, he'd forgotten about it. Uh, this is because mm. the, 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 the Kautsky text is from 1904, 1905. Um, and maybe he just didn't have this whole collection of Dinoit site to hand, etc. I don't know. Um, mm. But it, you know, a lot of water had passed under the bridge mm. since, you know, since those two dates. Um, so I don't have a, a full explanation. But as you say, Lenin was very familiar. He was probably the. Uh, I was speaking about this with Lars last night. Zinoviev once said that Lenin was the person in Russia who knew Marx and Engels the best. Um, but he was probably also the person in Russia who knew Kautsky best, right? <laughs> and uh, Dinoyet uh, you know, if you go to Lenin's preserved study, he's got a complete collection there uh, of the journal. I don't know if he had it on the t- <laughs> this time when he was writing uh, State and Revolution and, and the, the Renegade Kautsky, but um, he, it, it, I'm pretty sure he would have read it, because at least at the time, because it was a response to debates at the, international con- uh, the, the Congress of the International in Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. So Lenin, Lenin very famously was, you know, massively interested in Congress reports and looking at votes and, uh, you know, who said who said what and who's, you know, uh, against whom. <clears throat> so he certainly would have read. I, I'm pretty sure uh, that he would have read the the, the Republic and Social Democracy in France. Uh, yeah, given that this has have been uh, seven or eight different articles. Uh, yeah, maybe not it's an entirety, but I'm sure yeah. you know he would have he would have picked up at least on the uh, the debates between Babel right. and and, uh, and Jaurès, and you know I'm sure he would have then said, still oh, I wonder what Kautsky say for sure. Um, so this is really a theory of states that it is uh, that is opposite to the current dominant view on the left that either reside within the current constitutional confines of the state uh, or fetishize the Soviet form mm-hmm. uh, on the other side. Yeah. So Engels spoke of the Democratic Republic as the specific form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm-hmm. And Marx put it as the political form at last discovered under the under which uh, to work out the economical uh, uh, emancipation of labor. Yeah. So what is this form, if not one of the other two? Uh, th- the so, uh, so what is this form, if not the con- current constitutional form of bourgeois uh, republics, or oh, on the see. other side, the Soviet? I see. One. See it now. I get it. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's the um, that's Kautsky's point of departure. So that if we ch- we take some uh, some examples, he's looking at the the French Third Republic, mm-hmm. uh, bourgeois republic, uh, which you know you could it was a was a modern liberal republic in many ways. Uh, you could uh, compare it, I suppose, with the Weimar Republic. It's a very uh, uh, kind of loose uh, analogy, but it's you know broad in broad terms, it could be seen as a as a modern liberal democracy. Um, and a lot of French socialists are saying that basically that is kind of what we want, right? That's 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 what we can that, that we can we can use this form to introduce the, ref- the 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 social reforms that we want, and we've kind of achieved our goal. Um, and Kautsky says, no, that's not the case uh, for a number of reasons. And he highlights, um, he, he basically draws on Marx and Engels um, for uh, on, on their writings on, as you quote, the, the Democratic Republic and says, well, what is the basis of uh, uh, of what we understand as Democratic Republic, the last form of bourgeois society, I think Marx calls it as well, um, in which the working class can assume power and then usher in immediately the transition to a higher form of society. Mm-hmm. Um and you know those are things like uh, the armed people, the election of, of officers, judges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, wide, wide-ranging democracy uh, throughout uh, uh, throughout the state, um, and 
he contrasts that to uh, the experience of the Third Republic. As to the Soviet form, mm-hmm. now um, that's a slightly more uh, complex question. But the all I would say is that with the uh, the, the Russian Revolution, the, the Soviets, etc., um, that was essentially uh, the form that the Russian Revolution uh, assumed, right? Uh, but the underlying uh, democratic republican content was the same as, say, ex- an experience like the Paris Commune. So you have two different ways of arriving at the true democratic, the Mar- democratic republic, the Marxist uh, republic. Um, uh, but with, and they take different forms because they they result of different processes, different revolutionary processes. But ultimately, the the form is the same. So yes, you do have the armed people uh, as 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 a defence of the revolution. You do have regular elections in the Paris Commune. Of course, you had all elected officials subject to a workers' wage, recallability, uh, the uh, widespread democracy into localities. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the that's the the, the basic understanding, and that. Uh, it were, it's a point worth stressing. Also, finds reflection in the minimum program of the SPD and the effort mm. program. All the, 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 as I said, the one exception I point that out, and it's important omission, is the workers' wage question. Mm. Uh, that's the one that doesn't come up. But apart from that, literally, you can just see where uh, the the conditions that Marx and Engels outline relative to the Paris Commune as as, a, as an incarnation of the dictatorship of the proletariat or the democratic republic, they use them uh, interchangeably, mm-hmm. and then find rep- re- immediate reflection in the demands of the uh, uh, minimum program of social democracy. And by the way, it's also worth noting that the uh, they also find uh, expression in the minimum program of the RSDLP uh, right up to and beyond October 1917. There's a nice article I quoted in the discussion on the German Revolution the other night uh, where Lenin is basically making the point that we still need our minimum program within mm. days before the October Revolution. So that's kind of the form that the Marxist form that was envisaged by Marx and Engels and developed by Kautsky in this article, mm. subsequently dropped, unfortunately, um, but uh, but and, and also taken taken as read by by Lenin in up, precisely upholding the uh, the, the the revolutionary minimum program of German social of of, of social revolutionary social democracy before 1914. Right. Does that now, answer the question? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't. Well, yeah. Well, you you, you made it a nice uh, nuanced uh, answer, I believe. But there there are some um, question marks you can place with fetishizing the Soviet form, which is popular in some uh, leftist sure. uh, circles. I believe sure. Moshe Makhova made the argument quite well um, that the Soviet form is actually quite undemocratic. Right. Um, <laughs> but but th- th- that's a different type of question. Uh, the, the, no, it's the type of, it is relevant. It's yeah, relevant. yeah. I, I, mean, all I would say with Soviets is that, you know, you have two experiences. We discussed this <clears throat> the other night in the discussion on the German Revolution as well. You know, the the, the Soviets in Russia ultimately succeed because of the political leadership of the Bolsheviks and the left SRs, at least initially, right? Um, in Germany, the Soviets are unable to succeed because their political leadership is the SPD, the SPD right. So mm-hmm. they're able to kind of co-opt that. So the, the what you know, the, the question is, if all any representative institutions that are thrown up you know, are they able to provide the backbone to uh, facilitating working class power? And if so, that's great. But they, they, they do need to be backed up by a political program that can coordinate them, whatever form it's going to take. I don't think there's a natural form of revolution. I think there are all sorts of ways in which, you know, a revolution could happen by a left wing a party or left wing parties gaining a huge vote in an election and, and, and triggering a crisis. I'm not talking about Jeremy Corbyn here or something, you know, but I'm talking about, you know, re- revolutionary organizations uh, getting a huge vote um, and then triggering some sort of crisis. The question is, what happens then? Uh, and w- what is the form and, and you know, what, what are the demands that will be advanced? And, you know, if 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 Soviets do come about and they start to be becoming that, that's the, 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 the kind of driving force, as it were, if that happens, Still, the point remains that in and of themselves, they cannot resolve, uh, they cannot pose an alternative to the capitalist state that still needs to be there. And that's what I call the underlying democratic republican form. Mm -hmm. And that's what needs to be there uh, in the face of a political alternative across those those institutions, you know, even across Soviet institutions and existing parliamentary or capitalist institutions, etc. Right. That's also a possibility. Lenin talks about that in October as well. Uh, October 1917. So. That I think is the is is my uh, uh, 
my point on on Soviets. Yes, as you say, it's been they've been fetishized, and you know, basically, it seems to be the case that we kind of wait around until they happen, and then when we do, our small, uh, scattered, incoherent forces suddenly become mass, and everything is good, <laughs> which I don't think is very magic. Awesome. Exactly. <laughs> well, that is magic. Yeah, I mean, it would be magic. <laughs> Now, uh, just before we uh, end this interview, there's a criticism I would like to raise, and I sure. believe you alluded to it yourself uh, a bit early on. Yeah. It is encapsulated in the following quote on page uh, 31 of your introduction, so I'll just uh, quote it. Sure. Um, there can be no socialism within the constitutional framework of the Kaiserreich, nor, for that matter, is socialism possible within the structures of the French Third Republic. So, then a unified republic but uh, not in the sense of the present French Republic, which is nothing uh, but the empire established in 1799, but without the emperor. Mm -hmm. Now, um, is socialism, that is proletarian political power, uh, uh, however possible within the national confines of Germany or France at all? Um, uh, if we established the Democratic Republic in Germany, would that be a basis of uh, establishing uh, socialism? Now, mm -hmm. the experiences of the 20th century, or even more recently, Syriza in Greece, um, that try to merely break with uh, a neoliberal dogma, mm -hmm. points to the contrary. So what did Kautsky put on the table on this question of sure. internationalism? So the, um, I mean, just just coming back on Syriza very quickly, uh, mm. I think that see, that that is an example of precisely taking office and not power, right? Yeah. And I'm sure you agree with me. So you know, so so the question is then, okay, say for example, let's move away from Greece, let's go to Germany today, and there's an SPD uh, um, mass organization uh, that, uh, in the context of some kind of crisis is able to take power or wins an election and comes to power, right? Not comes to office, but comes to power. Enacts its program, full minimum program, arming the people, regular elections, uh, so annual elections, people, all officials on a worker's wage, votes in the army, blah, 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 right? That, that's kind of the scenario we're talking about, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, that was the framework, you could say, of uh, Marx and Engels to a certain degree, uh, and and I think Kautsky takes that over as well. It should be stressed with Marx. Marx is actually opposed to the Paris Commune initially, but precisely on the grounds that it's not going to go very far if it's just Paris or just even France, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the but I do think it, it is something that is in Kautsky uh, potentially is that there isn't a theorization of the um, the overall uh, uh, European context and, 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 as you said, the international context. Having said that, in his defense, um, if you read his writings on Russia, uh, he is always of the opinion that uh, Russia is the kind, has become the kind of vanguard of the world revolution. He, he didn't use those terms, but he's, it, it's become the leading force in, in, uh, in the, uh, the proletarian movement, the most politically advanced part in, in, uh, of, of the whole. And he always says that what what if something happens in Russia, it's going to unleash uh, all sorts of things in in Austria, in Germany, etc. And indeed, like uh, you're looking back at 1905, uh, they talk about all all the German Social Democrats, uh, Luxembourg, uh, uh, Kautsky, etc. They talk about how um, that wave of, of strike action and, uh, and revolutionary upsurge in 1905 uh, fed into countries such as Belgium. Right mm. or yeah or, or Germany uh, and and so so th it's not that they didn't they weren't aware that the, there was an international revolutionary process but potentially as as a criticism of Kautsky uh, you could say well okay how does this fit into the uh, the broader framework because even as you say even if we're not talking about Syriza or Corbyn or something like that we're talking about a revolutionary organization coming to power in a single country well the question is what then um, and I think you know the clear um, the, the obvious thing to say is that you know the 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 shift to the, the, an understanding of Europe, etc., is important. Um, but there's certainly, I think, I think there are problems in some of Kautsky's and other social democrats' conception of uh, and uh, you know revolution occurring in a nation state. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's I say it's simplistic to say they didn't theorize the ramifications that would have internationally, uh, but maybe. In terms of the uh, the coordination of that strategy, it it was lacking in in the mm -hmm. second international for sure. You know, it's um, 
that, you know, they were mainly concerned with growing their forces <clears throat> and, avo- and stopping the war. Right. And uh, so that, that's that's probably that something is that you, you could raise as a, as a criticism of uh, of Kautsky in, in his time, as it were. Because um, at the, the First World War, when basically the Second International fell apart, um, we saw exactly the opposite go- going on. Eh? The, the nationalism uh, taking hold of the workers' movement and, well, basically, well, um, uh, going into the trenches uh, and, and killing, uh, sure. uh, slaughtering each other uh, off. Uh, so that that's under terrorization um, actually costed many millions of lives in that sense i'm not, I'm not sure if you if you can draw <laughs> yeah no, i'm not sure if you can draw, I, I think it, it's perfectly legitimate to say and you can even say it in terms of uh, uh, uh marx and engels on some degree because i think marx's objections to the, the paris commune initially is is well it's just paris right i mean what, what you're going to do about the countryside in france huge peasantry in france blah 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 you know mm. so, but i but i do think generally speaking um, and, and this is certainly true of, of, of Kautsky and the, 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 you know, basically the ideas of the Erfurt program as well is that mm-hmm. this will happen in Germany. This will be a German thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, it'll, it'll then uh, set into motion all sorts of other things. Uh, and again, these are questions you cannot answer with an algorithm <laughs> straight no. up, uh, up, up, up ahead. But at least with the international, they did try and coordinate their action as much as possible. And as I say, um, whenever Kautsky, the way Kautsky viewed uh, global interconnected revolution, which he did, he did see such a thing, was that it would basically come from the east and and blow over, and you know that's kind of what happened. It's just that the uh, by that point, I think the international forces, for reasons you allude to uh, just now, um, were so scattered, were so um, uh, weakened, and organisationally uh, at odds, etc., that that wasn't possible, uh, and that's kind of the, the tragedy of it. But. It was a slight hyperbole, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Emil. Uh, the book is, for me. Uh, the book is now out by Academic Press uh, Brill, uh, Brill in the historical, in yes, uh, the historical materialism series, in issue number one hundred and ninety-six. But um, insiders will know that uh, it is better to wait. So, do we have yeah. words on when we get a much cheaper version on the Haymarket? We do. I think it's something like October the 9th. And I think if oh. you go if, if you go on Amazon, you can actually get a pre-order. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a pre, there's a page for the paperback already. And it says available on X date uh, in October, um, and you can you can look that up, and basically then you can you can pre-order it from Amazon if you want, or wait and, and until someone else gets it in October. Uh, but I think it's something like October the ninth, uh, so good. six six days before Kautsky's birthday. <laughs> great, great, that's a great date. Um, so, and do we have any word on uh, new books for coming from you? Uh, I. Uh, I will. I will. <laughs> I, I'm slightly reluctant to divulge too much at the moment, but uh, yes, I, I do have plans for uh, some future things uh, with with Lars Lee. Um, oh, nice. yeah. So nice, nice uh, teaser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice teaser. So it's definitely going to happen. We we met yesterday, actually, Lars and I on Zoom, as is as is the the, the thing to do these days. Um, and uh, we we're, we're throwing down some plans that it'll take some time, but uh, especially given my personal situation and with family commitments and everything. But it, it's it's kind of uh, coming together, and hopefully, be more uh, interesting stuff for people to get their teeth into. But that, that's all for now. You will hear back from me soon, though. So okay. Well, uh, <laughs> thanks again, and uh, no, we'll meet. Uh, we'll meet again. We'll meet again. Thank <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very much.